Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Roxanne Eflin. I'm the Vice President of the Historic Preservation Alliance of Colorado Springs. We are a member-based advocacy and education organization celebrating our 21st year. And it is our great honor to be co-hosting this series of suffrage lectures with the Pioneers Museum. So thank you all for joining us. Um, this is a very exciting trio of lectures. Um, we had begun this whole series in our winter lecture series. And then of course, pandemonium with the pandemic broke out and we had to shut everything down. So um, it's uh, the timing of this presentation in this anniversary year is profound in so many ways. And we are so grateful that our speakers and the Pioneers Museum was able to, to cooperate with us and to present all this via Zoom and virtual. So welcome all of you. Um, we have of course had to stop everything that we were doing, including our annual summer evening tour series. So we're grateful to have our three speakers join us. Um, so thanks to technology and Zoom, all of you are here and safe with us. And uh, we're gonna kick it off. And I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Heather Jordan, who will present Susan B. Anthony and the Colorado Women's Suffrage Redemption of 1877. Heather is an archivist and joined the Pikes Peak Library District's special collection in 2011. She has been a contributing author or editor for several regional history series books. Heather is a member of the Academy of Certified Archivists and on the board of the African American Historical and Genealogical Society of Colorado Springs. She holds a master's in information science from the University of Michigan. And so please welcome with me, Heather Jordan, who will take it away. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see my PowerPoint. So give me just a moment. And we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you for the introduction. As she said, my name is Heather Jordan and today I'll be discussing the Colorado Women's Suffrage Referendum of 1877. More specifically, I'll be talking about Susan B. Anthony and her travels around the state of Colorado campaigning for the passage of the referendum. We're able to get a fairly good idea of what this was like for her through a variety of sources. So we have her journals, correspondence that she wrote, and also local newspaper articles. And I'll be sharing some of those with you today. As we talk about the various counties that she visited, uh, I will be sharing the voting results for those counties. And then towards the end of the presentation, I'll be talking about the voting results for Colorado as a whole as well. So most of you are probably at least a little bit familiar with Susan B. Anthony already. Um, and since we really wanna focus on her time in Colorado, I'll keep this part brief, but I just wanna do a few highlights here. Susan B. Anthony was born February 15, 1820 in Adams, Massachusetts. She was born into a Quaker family. She had six siblings and her parents were supporters of temperance, women's rights and abolition. In 1839, she began working with the New York State school system. Of course, teaching at that time was one of the few profession, professions for women. Um, she eventually became headmistress of a girls department um, at an academy in Rochester, New York. In 1852, she attended her first women's rights convention. And that same year, she founded, along with others, the Women's New York State Temperance Society. Um, one of those other women was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, she was a suffragist and a leading figure in the women's rights movement. And she worked with Susan B. Anthony quite a lot. Together, they, along with Parker Pillsbury, published a weekly paper called The Revolution from 1868 to 1870. 
And this was the official publication for the National Women's Suffrage Association, which was founded by Anthony and Stanton. In 1872, she was arrested for casting what was considered to be an illegal vote during the presidential campaign. And in 1888, she founded the International Council of Women. And this is an organization that advocates for the rights of women around the world. This is actually still an organization that's around today. And from 1892 to 1900, she served as president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And I could go on, uh, but we want to get to her time here in Colorado, so we'll keep moving here. So before I talk specifically about where she stopped in Colorado, I want to talk a little bit about the 1877 referendum. During the 1875-1876 convention to draft the Constitution for Colorado, several delegates were hoping to include equal suffrage in the Constitution. Uh, they were outvoted and is sort of a consolation prize of sorts it was decided that they would let voters decide the issue by a referendum in 1877. And a referendum is a general vote by the electorate on a single political topic. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see Dr. Avery. She's thought to be the first woman uh, licensed to practice medicine in the state of Colorado. She was president of the Colorado Women's Suffrage Association, she was also um, a member of the American and National Suffrage Associations. And through her connections, she was able to bring in a lot of national activists to help campaign for the referendum. So she was able to bring in people like Matilda Hinman, Margaret Campbell, and of course, Susan B. Anthony. On the right hand side of your screen, you can see an image of Lucy Stone. She was able to bring her here as well. Lucy Stone dedicated her life to battling inequality. She was the first woman to receive a college degree in the state of Massachusetts. And while she was married, she did not take her husband's last name. Her husband was Henry Blackwell, and he also came to Colorado to help campaign for the passage of the referendum. Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell preceded Susan B. Anthony by one to two weeks. They stopped at a lot of the same locations before eventually breaking off and focusing their attention around the Denver area. So these national activists join local activists and they canvassed the state of Colorado, speaking wherever there were men, AKA the people able to vote. Uh, they spoke to people such as miners, farmers, and ranchers. And local newspapers covered this uh, quite a bit as well, um, some more negatively and some more positively. And I'll share some excerpts from those papers later today. So Susan B. Anthony focused on the 14th and 15th amendments during her lectures. On the left-hand side of your screen here from the 14th amendment, it says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. She argued that the 14th Amendment's definition of a citizen of the United States included women, and therefore women were not receiving their full citizenship. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see from the 15th Amendment, it says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Her argument was that it included women when it said the right of citizens of the United States to vote. In the center screen here, you can see a female delegate arguing um, in favor of women's voting on the basis of these two amendments. And this image comes from the Library of Congress. And Susan B. Anthony's hope was that if the referendum passed in Colorado, that the rest of the West would follow. So Susan B. Anthony was not new to life on the road. 
She traveled around the country giving lectures for 45 years. Uh, for this particular campaign, she was in her 50s, and she gave close to 100 speeches a year. She traveled in all sorts of different weather conditions, as well as different modes of transportation. So she traveled through snowstorms, blizzards, she traveled by train, wagon, boat, sometimes even by sleigh. She was often the only woman in the room speaking to a room full of men. And she spoke at any public venue that would have her. So this could include churches, hotels, uh, railroad stations. And you'll see today uh, that she spoke in all of those places while she was here in Colorado. Reception to her lectures was often mixed. Sometimes she was welcomed warmly, other times more negatively. Uh, she writes about a time in the 1860s while giving an anti-slavery lecture, uh, being pelted with rotten eggs. She wrote about having to be escorted to and from the speaking venue by police for safety. But no matter what, she always stood her ground. Okay, so now we're gonna move into her travels around Colorado. So before I begin this, uh, I wanna apologize in advance if I mispronounce any of these towns' names. I'm also gonna be reading a lot of direct quotes. So if I'm looking down quite a lot, I just wanna make sure I get that right. So, Susan B. Anthony began her tour in Granada, Colorado on Tuesday, September 11th, 1877. Located in Bank County on the Eastern Plains of Colorado, Granada was little more than a railroad station and this is exactly where she ended up speaking. She spoke in the waiting room of the railroad station. She wrote pretty detailed summaries of this campaign um, to a paper called The Ballot Box. And the ballot box was a paper by the Toledo Women's Suffrage Association in Ohio. And about this particular stop, she wrote, there was no hotel, no church, no schoolhouse. So I spoke in the railroad depot to a dozen men, as many women, and double the number of children and babies. There were only 40 voters in the precinct. On the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see an image um, of a page from her journal. And it's a little bit hard to read, as you can tell, but I'm gonna read just a little section from that particular day. She wrote, they had never heard a lecture, seen a tract, or seen a newspaper on women's suffrage. This one lecture can do very little toward lifting the men out of all their traditional and educational feelings and prejudices. I do wanna also add, if you're interested in viewing Susan B. Anthony's journals, they are digitized and available at the Library of Congress. And at the end of my presentation, I will be providing you um, with a link to that if you're interested in reading them. Okay. So the next day she made her way to Los Animas, also in Bent County. Fort Lyon, a military post was located two miles north. And the image that you're looking at is the canyon of the real Los Animas taken by William H. Jackson. You can see across the top of your screen, the Denver and Rio Grande, and that's pulling uh, passenger and baggage cars. She seemed more optimistic about this particular stop than her first stop. She wrote in her journal that it was a fine audience among them, a good representation from Fort Lyon. And what's interesting about the newspaper articles um, is that a lot of them wrote pretty negatively and some more positively. The Chieftain in Pueblo tended to write more negatively while the Rocky Mountain News was typically more positive. Um, of this stop, the Chieftain wrote, one or two more speeches of like character will make old Bent solid against it. While the Rocky Mountain News wrote Susan B. Anthony addressed a large and intelligent audience here last night and made a decided impression favorable to the cause. A great many heretofore indifferent or opposed are now wavering. So at the end of the day, the total votes in Bent County were 78 men voting for the referendum to pass and 273 against. So you're looking at around a 22% approval there. On September 13th, she makes her way to Pueblo. 
The Santa Fe Railroad reached Pueblo the year before, so 1876. This was a major center and it met the Denver and Rio Grande here. And this stop was a little bit different than her first two stops. Um, and that's because when she arrived, no one knew she was coming. So she got in around four o'clock in the afternoon and no one was there to greet her and they were surprised that she was there. According to her journals, uh, Lucy Stone, who had been there previously, didn't tell anyone uh, that she was coming and the tour organizers also failed to mention that she was going to be there. Somehow, quite impressively, I think, between 4 p.m. and that evening, she managed to book a hall, print leaflets and distribute those leaflets and speak to a full house. She wrote to the ballot box, their largest hall was packed, men standing in every available spot. And when at the close of my speech, an immense majority of that curious crowd voted aye, I felt better natured and right well paid for all my worry and hard work. She was introduced by a man named Mr. Hughes, who she writes was a large lumber man. She also makes a note in her, uh, her journal that this was a tough audience. She doesn't know specifically why they were a tough audience. Um, however, the editor of The Chieftain the week before had started an anti-suffrage campaign against the referendum. So they may have been um, listening to her lecture with some preconceived notions ahead of time. Um, in Pueblo County, there were 11% of the men voting for the referendum. We had 103 for, 793 against. So her next stop was in Walsenburg. She turned south and took the Denver and Rio Grande 60 miles to Walsenburg in Huerferno County. This was a settlement of Mexican and German farmers and ranchers. According to her letters, this lecture was also a packed house. And from what I can tell, every single lecture she gave during this campaign was full of people. About this particular stop, she wrote, I spoke at Walsenburg, a precinct numbering 190 voters. 150 of these are Mexicans, the other 40 mainly Germans. Had nearly every white man and woman of the town, and in addition, some 20 or 30 Mexicans unable to understand a word. I stood braced against the wall to the very close. Then the hall was cleared of the benches and the Germans had a jolly two hours of dancing and music, which my Quaker feet could not participate. So in this county, uh, the number of people that voted to pass the referendum was extremely low, less than 5%. Um, 32 men voted for it and 637 voted against it. There is some theory as to why particular counties uh, voted so low and I will talk about that in a little bit. I'm going to just take a quick drink of water here. Okay. So after Walsenburg, she made her way to El Moro and to Trinidad. She spent September 15th and 16th there. Um, she spoke at a hotel called the State Hotel in El Moro. Um, she spoke in the dining room. After dinner, they cleared the tables and the plates, and she spoke to what she describes as a goodly number of people. And then the next day, she went five miles to Trinidad. Um, this is her first stop where she stayed in someone's home and had hosts. And she seemed really happy about that. Um, she usually stayed in these newer hotels or slept on the trains. Uh, she writes about sleeping in a straw filled mattress laid on planks. So it's understandable why she was so happy to have a home to stay in. In her journal, she writes about enjoying a Christian cup of coffee um, and enjoying the society of cultivated New Yorkers. On your screen here, you can see pictures of the hosts. Uh, on the left hand side is Hannah V. Davis Swallow. And then on the right is her husband, George Ransom Swallow. They were not actually New Yorkers. Uh, they moved to Colorado from Illinois, where George worked as a banker. In 1881, he was the founder of the City of Trinidad's Board of Trade. 
And then in 1885, he became the state treasurer for Colorado. Overall, the number of men voting for the referendum here was similar to Pueblo County, so around 11%. So after Trinidad, Susan B. Anthony reversed direction and she headed north to board the San Juan line of the Denver and Rio Grande. She headed west into the San Greta Cristo Mountains over La Vida Pass, and you can see an image of La Vida Pass here. The tracks were completed in August and she was on them the next month in September. In her journal, she writes about this uh, travel. She wrote, I started at 6 a.m. for Garland over Levita Pass, the highest point yet reached by any railroad in this country. It is simply appalling as the narrow gauge steam horse puffs, puffs up, up the heavy grades of the zigzag road to look at the depths below you. At 8 p.m. we reached the hardly three month old city and at 8.30 I had eaten supper, arrayed myself and was speaking to a crowd of men, women and children packed into the dining room of a hotel the first nail of which was not driven 30 days before. Elva Adams, who later became governor of Colorado, happened to be at this particular lecture. And he noted that while the audience was good natured, they were not particularly sympathetic to what she had to say. It was mostly made up of men, including prospectors, railroad workers, gamblers, and saloon men. And this town was actually built to serve the railroad workers. And the year after Susan B. Anthony was there, they disassembled the buildings and moved them west to Alamosa. So on September 18th, Susan B. Anthony writes, up again, breakfast eating aboard the stage for Del Norte around six o'clock. We at once struck across the San Luis Valley, 65 miles wide and 200 long, surrounded on all sides by high mountain ranges. In Del Norte, Susan B. Anthony was again happy to have a residence to stay in. She did say, however, that after that journey, she was feeling weary and tired and utterly forlorn. So it was quite a long trip for her. She stayed with a couple named the Richardsons. Uh, Warren Richardson, she refers to as the baker in her journals. Uh, it's not noted what Mrs. Richardson's name is though. And Lucy Stone also stayed with the Richardsons, um, but she doesn't give Mrs. Richardson's name either. So while she was here, she spoke in a Methodist Episcopal church. And again, a full crowd. You can see an article here on your screen from the Rocky Mountain News. Um, and I'm just going to read a sentence from that. They wrote, many who wavered upon the question of women's suffrage are today its earnest friends, and many who were opposed before are silenced. The votes to approve the suffrage referendum were a bit higher here than her previous stops, quite a bit higher here actually, with 42% of the men voting to pass the women's suffrage referendum. The next day, she began her ride to Lake City. She rode 84 miles. This took her all of September 19th and half of September 20th. She didn't arrive in Lake City until the afternoon of the 20th. This ride sounds pretty treacherous. Uh, she writes in her journal that the ride down the mountain pass, Slum Gullion, was the most fearful rough and tumble I ever experienced. Her stage crossed through Slumgullion Pass on a private toll road at a high, eleva high elevation before beginning a sharp descent down into the Gunnison River, or not into, toward the Gunnison River. Uh, she found it frightening, but she also wrote in her journal about how beautiful it was. She writes about the bright moon and the magnificent scenery. At around midnight, they reached Wagon Wheel Gap, which you can see here on your screen. And at this stop, she took a tin cup and, as she describes, trudged through the sand to the Rio Grande Bank, bound to drink from the pure cold waters from the snow peaks above. She also notes that during this uh, particular part of her travels, she was the only woman um, in a stage filled with men. 
So when she finally reached Lake City in the afternoon of September 20th, uh, she was very, very happy with the turnout. Uh, she also was happy with the enthusiasm of the crowd. Um, Lake City grew quite a lot between 76 and 1877 because of the newly opened silver mines. Um, so there were a lot of people there. And she wrote to the ballot box, my meeting at this place last night surpassed all before it in number and enthusiasm. Their largest audience chamber would not begin to hold the people. It was a magnificent sight. No man-made temple ever contained a more attentive and respectful audience. Because there were so many people wanting to hear her lecture, they had to move from inside of the courthouse to the steps of the courthouse where she stood on a dry good box to give her lecture. Silver World, the local paper, did a write-up on her uh, lecture, which you can see here on your screen. They wrote, the hearty and enthusiastic affirmative vote given when we consider the fact that our miners have no squeamishness about expressing their opinions was sufficient to convince those in attendance that the friends of equal suffrage are by no means so hopelessly in the minority in Hinsdale County as opponents would have us believe. In Hinsdale County, 332 men voted to pass the referendum, 571 voted against it. So around 37% of the voters did want to pass the referendum in that county. Her next stop uh, during her campaign was meant to be Uray, Colorado. However, she writes that it was impossible to reach. I'm gonna read what she wrote about what she would have had to do had she gone to Uray. She wrote, my appointment for tonight at Uray is 50 miles across the mountain on Burrowback by a frightfully dangerous trail, which no mountaineer would attempt in today's rain and hail and at the top of a snow pass. 125 miles around by private carriage, which would take three days and camping out at night. So that sounds pretty intense. Um, apparently the organizers of the tour simply didn't know how difficult it would be to reach you, Ray. Uh, Dr. Avery did end up writing to Susan B. Anthony, expressing her disappointment that she didn't go. Um, but as she wrote in some correspondence, while it was an important stopping point, it was simply impossible to, for her to reach this town. So after several days of travel, she made her way to Sawatch. She arrived on September 24th, 1877. The local paper seemed pleased with her lecture. They called it the ablest yet delivered upon the subject. But they also predicted that the referendum would only pass in Boulder County Weld County and El Paso County. Uh, whether or not that's correct, we'll see in a little bit. After her lecture, the Honorable H.B. Felton told Anthony that while uh, Lucy Stone made a appeal, uh, Susan B. Anthony made an argument. So he appreciated what she had to say. Um, in Sawatch County, around 25% of the men voted to pass the referendum. She then traveled through Poncho Pass into the upper Arkansas Valley and made her way to South Arkansas, Colorado. Uh, this is now Salida. She stayed in the home of a man named James True. Mr. True had lost his wife previously that spring. And so she notes in her journal that this was her first time staying in the home um, of someone where there was no other woman present. She also notes that it was uh, that he cooked for her um, and she says that he had advised her to skip her last six stops and go straight to Denver. Um, why he advised her to do that, I'm not sure. Um, she did not heed his advice and she did make those last six stops. So the first three of those six stops were Texas Creek, Granite, and Oro City. Um, you can see an image here of Granite. And she didn't really note much of interest for those three stops. Again, just that they were full um, houses where she spoke. Um, so I'm not going to focus too much on those three since she didn't really have a whole lot to say about them. She then made her way to Leadville. That's in Lake County. 
And she spoke here to what she describes as the roughest group of men she ever encountered, the miners. The image you're seeing here is of the Hyman Saloon in Leadville. From what I can tell, she spoke at a saloon owned by a man named William Nye, but I couldn't find an image of the William Nye Saloon. Um, but I did want to just show you what a saloon during that time in Leadville looked like. Uh, this particular image is from the Denver Public Library. <clears throat> she spoke in a saloon because it was the largest public space available. And as always, it was a full house. Uh, There's so many people that men were spilling out onto the street. And while she describes them as the roughest group, they also seem to be actually pretty good natured. Uh, the saloon owner draped cloth over the liquor bottles due to her temperance views. When she started coughing, they put their pipes out. Uh, they kept drinking though, of course, they were in a saloon. Um, she was surprised at the end of her speech when they all applauded for her. And when she asked for donations, they passed around a hat and put gold dust in it. So while being pleasantly surprised by how kind they treated her, um, she did still note that she didn't think any of them would be sympathetic to uh, the women's rights uh, referendum. In Lake County, uh, 128 men voted to pass the referendum. 331 voted against it, so around 27% approval here. And her last two stops before the election day were Alma and Fair Play. And she reached those on September 30th and October 1st. When she went to Fair Play, she found posters um, all over the town reading a new version, suffrage, free love in the ascendancy, Anthony on the Gale tonight. The posters upset the citizens of the town and she did end up drawing a large and respectful audience here. In Park County, around 31% of the men voted to pass the women's suffrage referendum. So finally, we reached election day on October 2nd, 1877, after a long and tiring campaign for her. On this day, Susan B. Anthony made her way to Denver. She didn't sound overly optimistic, but there was perhaps still a little bit of hope there. She wrote to the ballot box, the friends everywhere are very hopeful, and I too might be had I not before me, Michigan and Kansas, or could I imagine men of Colorado would vote any better than did the farmers in those states? But no one will be more rejoiced if they should than would Susan B. Anthony. So all that was left to do at this point was wait for the results. So the official return certified that 6,612 men voted to approve the women's suffrage referendum. 14,053 voted against it. Here on the screen, I've compiled the 10 counties with the highest number of voters. You can see that Boulder County did pass the referendum. Uh, 1,011 men voted for it, 804 voted against it. So the newspaper in Sawatch was correct when they predicted that Boulder County would pass um, the vote. However, it did not pass in Weld County or El Paso County. It did, however, receive over 40% of the vote in Weld County, as well as La Plata, Rio Grande, and Larimer counties. Unfortunately, though, at the end of the day, it was defeated two to one. So I'd like to share some of the thoughts and reactions of people uh, after the election results had come in. Obviously, Susan B. Anthony was not happy with the results. However, the chieftain was very happy with the results. Um, they wrote a pretty long article in the paper. Um, I'm gonna read a segment of that. It's a little bit on the long side, but I think it's interesting enough to share. They wrote, Colorado was considered by the female shriekers as an excellent place wherein to try experiments. They left their homes in New England, 
to make a desperate effort to have their pet hobby inaugurated here, knowing that its evil effects would not be felt directly by themselves and utterly regardless of the injury which might be inflicted upon us. Go home, Grandma Blackwell Stone. Depart Colorado, Susan Anthony. The people of Colorado are not at present prepared for your advanced ideas. Women's true sphere is in the center of the home circle and not at the polls. So it's very clear how they felt about that. Um, another theory as to why they were not able to pass the referendum was that the Colorado Women's Suffrage Association had only just formed the year before in 1876 and maybe didn't have enough of a base of organized support to draw from locally. And so having to draw so many national activists to Colorado perhaps didn't set well with local Coloradans. Henry Blackwell wrote that women's suffrage can never be carried by popular vote without a political party behind it. And other newspapers also had their theories. They wrote things such as men want more time to think over the matter. The mothers, wives, and sisters of voting men appear to be indifferent to the privilege. And it's too much to expect that this innovation could be brought about by a few weeks worth of work. Also interesting is that they may have had some issues with people actually being able to vote for the referendum. A voter in Trinidad told Congress that while there were tickets to vote against the referendum, they did not see a ticket that had the option to vote for it. Henry Blackwell stated that nothing ensured the tickets um, approving the measure were available to voters, which matches what was said about um, by the voter in Trinidad. And he also wondered if this was one of the reasons why Certain counties, such as uh, Huerfano County, who had less than 5% of voters um, approve the referendum, um, had such low results. He wondered if perhaps they just did not have the opportunity to even vote for it if they had wanted to. Um, and some of the counties uh, that she hadn't visited were even lower than that. Some of them had 99% of the men vote against it. Finally, Lucy Stone seemed determined for next time. She wrote, the suffragists of Colorado will now form county societies and renew the fight. Next time, they will win. All told, Susan B. Anthony made $165 from her speaking engagements during this uh, campaign. $100 of that went to her fair um, coming to and from Colorado. Um, including her meals and sleeper on the train. And the remaining $65 went toward her expenses during the campaign, including meals and stays at hotels. One of her brothers also provided her with some money to go toward her expenses. She received a few gifts um, during this time as well. A Mrs. Goodrich in California donated $50 toward her campaign. And a Mr. and Mrs. Hall of Ann Arbor, Michigan, donated a 320 acre plot of land in Arkansas as a tribute to her hard work during the campaign. She seemed very grateful for these. Uh, she wrote in her journal, it's a great comfort after all these years of financially unrequited work to receive such marks of appreciation. After the election, Susan B. Anthony stayed in Denver for 20 days. She stayed in the home of Dr. Avery, and she also met with Margaret Campbell and Matilda Hinman, who were also there campaigning, and they discussed that. It was during this time that she also wrote her lecture, Homes of Single Women. You can see a draft of that here on the screen. And she also gave lectures around the Denver area during this time. On the 23rd, she departed Colorado and began a new tour. She toured through Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Wisconsin. And she did that tour for the remainder of 1877, making around $30 or so a night. So I wanna share just a, a couple of the resources um, that I use that maybe you would be interested in. Um, if you'd like to view her journals, you can see them on 
the Library of Congress's website. They are all digitized. She does have a journal entry for every day of the Colorado campaign, as well as many other campaigns. Um, if you're interested in her correspondence, volume three of the selected papers of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony is really useful for that, um, particularly volume three because it covers 1873 to 1880. Um, so her correspondence during the campaign can be found there. Uh, the Pice Peak Library District has a lot of databases, including the three listed here, if you're interested in viewing uh, the local thoughts of uh, papers here during that time. And I also have a link here just for the voting results for all of the counties in Colorado. Uh, the screen I shared with you was just for the top 10 counties um, with the most voters, but if you're interested in seeing all the counties, you can look here. And of course, uh, Susan B. Anthony's campaigning here was not the end for the fight for women's rights, obviously. Um, and next Saturday, Kathy Sturdivant's going to continue this discussion by talking about the 1893 vote. So if you're interested, I highly encourage you to watch that. Um, hopefully you found it interesting to hear about this part of Colorado's history and what it was like for a prominent woman traveling around the state of Colorado pretty much alone. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer those for you. And I thank you so much for your time. Yes, Heather, thank you so much. That was fabulous. And we do have a couple questions. Folks, as a reminder, if you have questions for Heather, this is your opportunity to ask. Please use the chat function. So you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a little chat icon that you can click and you can type your question right in there. So um, we'll kick off with a question um, that I think if you could just elaborate on a little bit more, why okay. was Colorado, um, why was Colorado the state that was seen able to sway the rest of the voters in the West? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, I honestly don't know, but I do think next week when Kathy talks, she's going to speak about why specifically um, the vote passed for Colorado before other states. So I think she actually will be elaborating more on that. Um, so I'm interested to learn that as well. Excellent. And that's a great plug for Kathy's program. That's part two of this series. So that's going to be June 13th, also at 2 p.m. So make sure you register for that. Um, we have a question. Any idea what she meant by Christian cup of coffee? <laughs> so from what I can tell, um, a lot of the food and a lot of the drinks that she had while on the road were pretty um, gross. So I'm curious to see what the other cups of coffee uh, were like, but she said that meaning she had a real original cup of coffee that tasted like a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to describe that. Um, another question, and this is about your experience. What does it mean to you personally to have interpreted her diary? Well, actually, um, Chris Nichol discovered this uh, diary, um, and she'll be speaking, I think, in two weeks. And she actually brought it to me, and uh, I was very grateful that she did so. It was really fascinating for me to read. Um, just her thoughts and her feelings about each of these stops. Um, a lot of times when you're reading these um, journals or papers about these things, they're not maybe overly personal. So I really, really loved reading um, about how people reacted and her thoughts during this time. I think it was very brave of her to be doing this type of tour. I don't know that I could have survived it. it sounds very rough. Um, so I really found it fascinating. I learned quite a lot um, reading her journals and I highly recommend um, people taking a look at those. They're very fascinating. Was there something in particular that surprised you most when reading through those? Um, I think it was really interesting for me to see um, just during the research of this, the different reactions from the papers. Um, it's kind of uh, fascinating how every single Chieftain article I read was negative and every single Rocky Mountain News article I read was positive. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and I also found it interesting um, to see how much money she made or lack of money she made. I hadn't really thought about that when I think about her traveling and campaigning. So that was new information to me too. We did have a question about how she was financed. 
Yeah, so a lot of it was through donations. Um, her family members also helped her out with expenses. Um, and then her tour organizers um, also gave her money um, during her tour. And I think that was probably the case in a lot of her tours. So this is quite the question. Um, first of all, compliments to you for this, to start this question off. Um, but do you think you would have liked Susan personally? <laughs> oh, maybe sometimes. <laughs> um, I don't know. She could be a little bit maybe controversial about certain things that um, maybe I would or would not agree with. But um, I like her fighting spirit. And uh, I don't know that I would have necessarily been great friends with her, but I definitely respect what she did. That's awesome. And did she support any other causes? Was she vocal about any other causes? Um, she mostly focused on women's rights, but she did um, occasionally do also uh, anti-slavery lectures. Okay. And then here, um, did Susan travel mostly alone without a companion or an assistant? From what I can tell, she did travel mostly by herself. Um, she did have people helping organize the tour, sort of telling her where to go and things like that. Um, but for the most part, she was by herself, um, which during that time probably was uh, quite an experience. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah. And did she travel with Lucy Stone ever? Do we have record of that? You know, I'm not sure if she did. She definitely did not for this tour. Um, Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell were together um, on their own, but she was not with them during this time. Um, whether or not she did in other tours, I'm not sure. Well, please, if you have any other questions, um, I'll just real quickly do a plug again for our upcoming programs. Um, if you would like to register for these programs, you can go to our website or the Facebook events. So if you're on Facebook, you can register or you can go to cspm.org. Uh, forward slash events, and you can find the June 13th lecture with Katherine Sturdivant and the June 20th program with Chris Nickel. So we hope you'll come back and join us for those uh, final two programs as part of our series. Um, it looks like we have one more question to finish off. And Heather, I just want to thank you again um, on behalf of HPA and the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. Uh, such a pleasure partnering with you for this fabulous series and, and just can't thank you enough for your time. So okay. we will um, end with, did she speak in Colorado Springs at all? She did not speak in Colorado Springs, no. Um, I did find a newspaper article about her being in Colorado Springs, but from what I can tell, she did not give a lecture while she was here. Well, perfect local tie in there. Thank you all again, folks. We are going to make this uh, recorded program available. So uh, we'll be sending it out. If you registered for the program, we'll send out the video. Um, or of course, you can go to the museum's YouTube channel. You just search us on YouTube and we'll have this available along with the other two programs as well. So thank you again, Heather. And I hope everyone has a safe and wonderful weekend. Thank you.